Well, I, I first, first came to Kodak in 1973, and I was working in a small uh, research laboratory in the apparatus division back then. And um, I was in an electronics group, and there was, a, there was a, a very small project that my supervisor, Gareth Lloyd, came to me in 1974 and, and suggested that uh, uh, I had a choice, actually, between two projects. One was to do, uh, I remember this, I remember the conversation, actually, like it was yesterday. He said there's two projects, real small ones. One was to look at the uh, exposure controls for XL movie cameras, and the other was to look at the imaging performance of these new type of devices called charge-coupled device imagers. And in college, I had, I had done some work on, on optically controlled uh, silicon devices, and so I was interested in how light affected silicon, so I jumped at the chance to do work with this new device called the charge-coupled device. So that's kind of how it started. And... Um, at, at the point when I looked at this, I looked at the device and I said, well, maybe if I was good to, to measure the imaging performance, I could try to build something that captured images. So maybe I could build a camera. And then from there it escalated to, wouldn't it be really neat to build a camera with all electronic, you know, no moving parts whatsoever. And then because my experience was largely digital, I decided to take a completely digital approach to it. Uh, it avoided a lot of mechanical complexity, which I was incapable of dealing with. So I just basically had a white piece of paper and started to sketch out what this thing would have to be like. And then with the help of two enormously talented technicians that were working in the labs, there was named Jim Schickler and Bob Dieger, were two fellows, really experienced fellows, and they and I basically cleaned out a back lab and started to build our circuits and put together our camera and do our experiments one after the other as we put together the camera until finally the camera and the corresponding playback system was uh, operational. And that was about a, after about a year's worth of work, as I remember. And it was, uh, we took our first picture in December of 1975. Uh, Jim Schickler and I worked shoulder to shoulder in the lab for many months to get this all to come together. And finally one day, the camera was working, we felt, and the um, playback unit was working. Now all you could see was, was voltage measurements and oscilloscope traces. There were no images to see. We said, well, we've got to take a picture of something. We've got to try it. And Jim looked at me and I looked at him and we said, we've got to find something better to take a picture of. So we walked down the, the hallway outside our laboratory and found a lab technician. Her name was Joy Marshall, Joy Marshall at the time. As a young lab technician, she was sitting at a teletype. I remember this because I was holding the camera and I went up to her and I asked her, can I take a picture? Um, and uh, she knew that we were s these strange people in the back lab doing something, and she looked at the camera and said, well, okay, and so I took a head and shoulder shot of her. She had black hair, was against sort of a white background, and the camera started to work, started to record, and we went back to the lab, we popped the tape out of the camera, put it into the playback unit, and then up popped the image, and the picture was, you could see the silhouette of the hair, um, you could see the white background, but her face was complete static. But Jim and I were just overwhelmingly happy with what we saw because there were a thousand reasons why you would see absolutely nothing. And we knew them all. And, and, and I remember standing with Jim, looking at this, saying, so much is working. And Jim said, yeah, man, a lot is really working. Now, Joy had followed us into the lab. She was standing behind us, and she was looking over our shoulders. She looked at the picture, and she said, needs work, turned around and walked out. And indeed, I had, um, I had mixed up uh, the order of the bits when I recorded it on the, on the tape in the camera, and I thought that they were uh, in a certain order, and I, re I reversed the order when I was uh, pulling them off the tape for the playback unit. So if it was all ones or all zeros, that is black or all white, it came out okay, but anything else in between was wrong. We figured it out after about an hour, and then the picture popped into view, and boy, we were happy then. Then the picture looked good. So that was the first picture. I like to kid people that if I had known anybody would have been interested in this camera 30 years later, we would have made it a lot prettier. If, you've, if you saw the camera, it's kind of a, an odd, odd collection of, of circuit boards in a steel frame with a blue box sitting on top and a lens sticking out. And um, the camera weighs about uh, eight and a half pounds. And I, as I remember, it's about eight inches wide and six inches deep and about nine inches high. So about the size of a small toaster. And like I say, weighed about as much as a toaster. Now, uh, I guess I stretched, uh, uh, you know, my credibility by saying it was handheld. But at the time, I could hold it. You could hold it and take pictures with it. So it was, we called it a handheld camera. Uh, I began to realize that 
there was a lot more to this. When I started making the presentations, in 1976, we started making internal presentations of the camera, where I would demonstrate the camera with people in the room. And, you know, I was all ready to answer questions about how it worked, right? I'd spent a year telling you all the, the little technical tricks we pulled to, to get this to work. And, you know, they asked me questions about what the impact of this would be, what the ramifications would be. You know, why would anybody want to look at their picture on a television set? How are they going to store these pictures? What's an what's a electronic photo album going to look like? Well, I really hadn't thought about any of that, you know. And I always asked, when is this going to actually be practical? I, I really hadn't thought about any of that. And uh, so to some one extent, I was sort of disappointed. No one was going to ask me all the technical details. But on the other hand, um, the conversations that ensued were, were really kind of interesting. And I was sort of a participant in people thinking about the future. If I look back over the 30 years, um, as much as we thought things would happen, even so much more happened, you know. Uh, and I think it's a general comment about anytime you're inventing anything, you look at your invention, but realize that the rest of the world's inventing along with you. So we didn't think about things like the internet or wide bandwidth connections or uh, desktop photographic printing, the thermal printing or inkjet printing. Those kinds of things really weren't in our discussion process at the time, you know, so discussion. So I, I think um, I'm amazed. Um, I, I've, I've witnessed it firsthand. Um, it's astounding to see what can happen over 30 years. Um, it's just hard to predict. You know, work that you did over 30 years ago, now it gets, you know, people are really interested in it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy and I'm, I'm gratified uh, that people are, are sort of take up and notice that Kodak was really doing pioneering work. You know, I, I look at this as really, they're really honoring the Eastman Kodak Company and the innovation work, innovative work they've done over the years. Hundreds of men and women over the years have done pioneering work in digital photography. We have fundamental intellectual property rights. If you're an experimenter and you're an inventor or anything like that, you, you really do spend most of your time failing. You really do. Um, so uh, you learn so much from that, you know. Uh, you, you, you just have to sort of go forward with your ideas. And, and lots of times they may not work out. They may not work out right then. Or they may work out if somebody else does something to it, you know. You're part of a big community going forward. You're not really alone <laughs> when you're inventing. Um, but I would just say don't be afraid of failure. Um, and, and, and enjoy yourself and have fun.